Alright. You can look at it for a little try. Good evening, folks. I'm here at the Baptist Temple in Plantation, and it's been a wonderful, beautiful day. I'm enjoying the Bible to, tonight with you. And we're going to be discussing one of the issues that we always face all the time, and that's is that issue, are we, about most of the Christian world that are not Catholic and Baptists and Protestants and, uh, and Pe uh, Pentecostals, tend to put our salvation with the Lord Jesus Christ into two categories. And most of, a higher percent, I think probably 90 percent uh, of the entire Christian world takes a position in this controversy. The controversy is, are we chosen? And are we the elect? And has God predestinated us as being adopted and, and as sons of God uh, connected to the Lord Jesus Christ? Or is it we all have a decision to make? And we all have free will. And we can only become the elect, which the Bible teaches absolutely that you have to be the elect or you can't go to heaven. The Jews were the elect, but they got removed, and now the Gentiles, by faith, become the elect. So are we the elect because we have free choice to become the elect? Or are we the elect because God in his foreknowledge has predestinated a small number of people on the earth, a very small percent, few there be that find it, uh, to be predestinated and to be the elect. That's the subject tonight. The great debate, predestination versus uh, lack of faith brings you into condemnation and brings you loss of salvation. So predestination versus uh, your own decision to decide that your fate will be that you decided to be saved and you have that free choice. You're looking at some beautiful verses here, and so we begin by looking at Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. So take your Bible, and as we begin. Now, Paul is writing about this subject, and so see if we can get something from it and understand it. God bless it. And so we begin by prayer, okay? Lord God Almighty, in Christ Jesus' name, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity to have a Bible, to have it preserved, to have it inspired. Oh, it's wonderful to know that, Father, and we do believe that the King James is one of those wonderful gifts of God, and that uh, you have been able to bring it down through the, all the centuries, and that we have the enduring Word of God, the perfect Word of God, like silver tried in the furnace of fire. Help us to understand that the furnace of fire uh, can purify things, and that we have the faith to believe, and we take the position that... God has created man out of sand. He's doing miracle after miracle, supernatural all the time, to make life on the planet exist. Help us to understand that tonight, in Christ Jesus' name. Paul writes, for by grace are you saved. Now, what is grace? Grace means it's free, free, free. It means that God is going to take you to heaven, either by predestination or by your free choice. One way or another, you're going to get there. And so we're trying to decide just what this means. But tonight, grace means that God has provided eternal salvation for you without you doing anything. For by grace are you saved, through faith, through joining the church, making the commitment, you know, coming forward and, and uh, choosing the church of your choice. You know, what is it? Is it by faith, as Paul says here, grace you are saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. So I'm reminded tonight to know that it is a gift of God and that means free, free, free being a gift. And not of any works lest any man should boast. And then we have another place, Ephesians 2, Paul wrote this, for when we were dead in sins, that means you're lost, there's no way you're going to go to heaven. He hath quickened us, that would be the believers. We now believe that we are elect by faith and so we, he has quickened us. Together with whom? With Christ. And then he repeats, For by grace are you saved. Ephesians 2 5. So now we've covered this twice. And uh, we appreciate everybody that came tonight. And God bless you. Love you. 
And uh, because we're on the camera of YBC, we have to go ahead. And then the third place we're reading today is uh, Romans 5, uh, 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, Paul wrote many, many, many verses that deal with being saved, going to heaven, and we're trying to uh, decide on, are we saved because we have a free choice? Are we saved because he's predestinated us through the Holy Spirit to draw us through enlightenment to who Jesus is and to accept him by faith where he does all the work? And so we take that position here at this church, at, in my belief. So we're justified by faith. This is, once again, I'm in Ephesians. Uh, and so, Christ, all, by whom also we have access by faith into the grace where we stand. This is Romans uh, 5, 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, by whom we have access by faith into the grace, which is free, 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 uh, which we stand. So that was in the book of Romans. We're still going ahead with the verses. You have it's a gift. We've been quickened, which means to be made alive in Christ. And uh, we're standing on that. And that means we have taken the position that God is doing it completely. We're not entering into anything other than being drawn to Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, what is the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit is one-third of the Godhead. Put it that way. Because God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So the God... Christ, of course, is the Son of God, born supernaturally of Mary, without a father, except coming by God the Father, having the, the male chromosome, or he wouldn't have been a male. Mary, being a female, was only able to make females. And God the Father, using Mary and uh, her genetic seed, and Jesus became born God. He didn't become God, he was born God, and that's what we believe, and many people believe that. So... Now in Romans, uh, who, uh, Romans uh, chapter 5, it says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. This is Romans 8.33. So in Romans 8.33, what Paul is trying to tell us again is this same subject. We have the word election. We have the word grace. And Paul is trying to tie that together. And he says, is there anybody, anything, anybody that can charge, put a charge against God's elect? In other words, if you're God's elect, you're going to go to heaven. Because it says here, it is God that justifies you. And that satisfies all the demands of the law of Moses, 618 different rules and regulations. The entire uh, charge of your sins by the Mosaic law is all satisfied by justification, Romans 8, 33. And then he puts the word elect there. So now, in Romans 8, 33, we have the word elect. We have the word justification, and we have the idea then that God does this since he knows what he's doing before the foundation of the world. So God expressly says in Ephesians chapter 1, other places, Revelation 18, excuse me, Revelation 17, 8, it tells us that God has determined before the foundation of the world that he's going to choose out from all the masses of trillions of people He's going to choose out a remnant, a small group. Jesus said, even few there be to find it. It's going to be a small group. So most of the entire world, plus the Christian world, according to the Bible, you have to be a born again. Remember what he said to Nicodemus? Nicodemus, you're a ruler of the Jews. You need to be born again. He had to be born from above. And Nicodemus said, well, I don't understand this. Can't you explain it? Jesus said, there are, there's two kinds of births. You have to be born of faith in the Lordship of Christ. And this is what he said. You must be born of the Spirit and the Word. Uh, the Word is recognized as the water of the Word. Ephesians 5, 25. Being, being born by the, by the Word of God, the Word of the Word, and by the Spirit of God. So there's two things that Nicodemus was told. You have to be born of the water, which is the Bible, Ephesians 5.25. Paul said, being washed by the water of the word. So the Bible is what we are saved with. And in the other part, you have to be born of the Spirit. And Jesus said that all in John uh, chapter 2 there. You must be born again. So we're passing on now.
still moving on in a world population. Who's saved? Who's the elect? Are we predestinated? Do we have a, uh, we, it's our own choice. And how do we solve that problem? We don't, except by looking at the Bible. So we're now moving ahead and we're going to take a look at Genesis 6. So looking at Genesis 6, here's a story. Let's see if we can understand the word grace. The first time in the whole Bible, the word grace is mentioned. Grace is mentioned in the Bible 220 times. Here is the first mention of grace. And it's in Genesis, in the story, where God destroys the whole world, but eight people. Now, that don't sound like a lot of grace, but somebody is being saved. He didn't save everybody, he only saved eight. Noah, his wife, three children and their wives, eight. Well, it looks like God's pretty selective there. Seems to me that this story is predestination. Because if you've got everybody that's lived for 1,665 years to the flood days, and there's only a few of them that are being saved, everybody else is being killed, wiped out. Well, why did God just pick Noah? And the Bible tells us that Noah had faith. And so we're, we're reading that in Genesis chapter 6. And so we're reading that. Verse number 8, Genesis 6, 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What is grace? It's something where God pays your bill. Go to the restaurant, pick up the biggest meal you want to, and I'll pay for it. That's what God is saying. In other words, he's paying for it. It's free, free, free. But somebody has to pay the bill. And all sin is against God the Father since he created everybody. And so God is satisfied the bill is going to be paid as long as you express your faith in the fact that Jesus died as the Lamb of God. He rose again, conquering death, raised by the Father had to raise him. He's dead. He can't even lift his hand. So the Father is raising dead, uh, raising Christ from the dead. And this is free, free, free. He's paying your debt. And, of course, in John 19, uh, he did say, it is finished. Which meant that the Old Testament law of 618 rules and regulations all came to an end. And when he said it is finished, he paid for the whole thing and the debt is canceled. And all you must do is have faith to accept it. Now, you can accept it because that's your choice or, you, you know, that's the choice. Or you can say, no, I accept it because God, through the power of the Bible, enlightened me and I got saved because... I found out what it was all about. I discovered that Jesus was the Son of God. And He enlightened me. I didn't do it willingly, particularly, but He enlightened me when I heard about the fact that Jesus was the Son of God and God the Son. I believed it, and now I've been repenting all my whole life. See? So, you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, then you overcome the world. And that's what Jesus said. Who is He that overcometh the world? He that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. So 1 John 5, we overcome the world and all of the seven churches of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3 of Revelation, describe how those people that were in the first seven churches of Paul, wherever he went, it all said, it says over and over, they overcame by the word of the Lord. And so that's something, you can check that out, the seven churches of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3. So we know now and believe that we overcome by faith in what Jesus does. He pays for it. It's free, free, free. It's called grace. It's mercy through the blood of the cross and the torture of Jesus. He was tortured pretty bad. Does it hurt when you have nails driven through your hand? How would you like a big spike driven through your feet? And what about a sword that pierced through his entire side? Remember when John saw him? And you remember all the... And Thomas doubted, said, I don't believe Jesus is alive. I saw him dead on the cross. And then Jesus said, well, look, Thomas, you see this hole in my side? Put your finger over here. Put your finger in my side. He came over there and looked and said, oh, my God, it's real. And uh, he said, my Lord and my God. He exclaimed that. He was convinced he could see it. It was positive proof. In chemistry, we call it empirical proof. In other words, you can weigh it, you can analyze it, and you can see it's physical. So we're in a world of science now. And through science, we learn a lot about the physical aspects of the universe. But we still don't understand the invisible things completely.
completely that we know are there, but we can't do anything but maybe look on them in a screen. So when you're looking at the electromagnetic, the electromagnetic energy for television and radio, I mean, you can't see it coming into, the, into your room, but you can see it on a screen, and you see television, you hear radio. So you know that electromagnetic energy is really there because you can see some physical evidence. And he's trying to tell us the same thing. There is an invisible force called God force. It's called the Holy Spirit. He works out of the King James Version, I believe, primarily now, today. And since uh, 1381, John Wycliffe and seven other major translators brought us to King James. And so over a period of about three or 400 years, from 1381 all the way to 1610, the Bible was being collected and it was being put in a language that did not exist. The English language did not exist when Wycliffe started out translating the Bible. God put it in the Wycliffe's mind and all the translators, and the English language came into existence sometime after the year 601. That was the first time somebody found a word in English. Uh, and before that, uh, everybody had uh, the Bible in the Greek. And so depending on which Greek uh, Bibles, uh, what we call the scrolls, that you had would depend on how accurate. So we know that the King James is very accurate because 300 years about before the NIV and all your new translations came out with all the perversions in them, 36,000 words that were taken out, omitted, so they didn't have the right uh, original copies of the right scriptures. They were copying from something that was totally uh, corrupted and perverted. And so what we know that the King James, we believe absolutely is flawless. It's like the originals. We state that, and everybody says, well, you're crazy, you know. No, no. I know a little, just a little bit about science, and I know that it's impossible to do what God did to make all the molecules of air and gas and whatever and come together and give us something that we could breathe and enjoy the food that's all necessary, infinite in wisdom and knowledge and provisions to make gases of all kinds and orders, exchange it, and be able to take a breath and live on planet Earth. Because there's nothing like this anywhere, anywhere. They've been still looking for water, never found water. You know, they come up with a bunch of lies on the channel sometimes. They say, well, you know, we found water. They never found any water, okay? Water doesn't exist except on planet Earth. And anybody that has knowledge of science should probably would say that. So but we have a lot of people learning all about things and they think they got it all down. No, they don't have it down. God created man out of nothing but clay and sand. He made all the waters of the oceans, three quarters of the earth is water. Doesn't exist anywhere in the universe. They've been finding it if they can find a quart, but a cup of water, but they can't. God is the power that makes all the life and plants and animals, and he takes all the inanimate objects, uh, molecules, whatever, puts it all together, makes it organic, makes it live, makes it reproduce itself, and we call it DNA and RNA. And we find it in every cell. That's a lie. And we only have somewhere about 445 different kinds of amino acids and 235 different kinds of protein in every single cell. And it's all lined up sequentially and it's called nucleotides, and some of you have heard that. It's called DNA. It's in every single cell of every leaf and every plant and every uh, animal that's alive. So God did it all. And what are we talking about? I don't know how we get off that, but we're talking about grace. And I'm reading now Genesis chapter 6. Are you there? I'm reading and it says, And the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. They took them wives of all of which they chose. In other words, they were, they were just simply marrying different men and women because they were tall, handsome, and good looking. And the Lord said, My spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, shall not strive with man. For his days will just be 120 years and then I'm going to kill everybody, he says. Genesis 6. And so when the sons of God, these are Bible-believing people, they believe in the Word of God, when they came unto the daughters of men, this is all the good-looking girls that were just regular uh, human women, and they bear them children. When they had children, what happened to their children? Well, some of the children didn't grow up in good families because uh, they were married for the wrong reason. And they were married because of good looks. And like uh, we do sometimes today, and we have families that are all broken because the marriages are not based on uh, some proper understanding. 
and what it takes to build a family. He saw the wickedness was great in the earth, and every imagination of the sauce was evil continually. He repented the Lord. He was sorry that he made man, and he said, The Lord, I will destroy man whom I have created. Revelation, I mean, still in Genesis 6. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is Genesis 6, 1 to 8. Grace is used throughout the entire Bible 220 times more, at least that many times more, which means mercy in action by God on human beings. If God has mercy on you and grace to you, then you will be saved. And you'll be saved by trusting in what he did when he painfully in agony took those nails and took the whip, cut himself all to pieces and planted thorns in his head. You see, it was a brutal, torturous thing. Willingly he did it. He did it to please his father. Can you understand that? Of course not. We can't comprehend the magnitude of the wisdom and love of God that Jesus would come to this earth and be born as a human being, be born as the Son of God and God the Son, and then willingly volunteer to go up there and have Pilate and say, crucify him, see, and they did. They thought he blasphemed. He said, are you the Son of God? He said, you're saying it. Yeah. And he said that one way or another throughout the book of John. You're saying that I'm the Son of God? Okay. I'm the Son of God. And Pilate said, take him out and crucify him. But the debt has been paid. It's free, free, free for you. And Jesus rose on the third day. And now, what happens in Genesis chapter 8 and 9? If you look, Genesis 8 and 9, we have the story where God killed everybody on the entire earth except eight. And eight he spared. Sounds to me that's pretty selective. You've got a trillion people on the earth, I guess. I don't know. They've been, they've been there for 1,600 years. And now he wipes everybody out except what? What percent is that? You know, you got eight. Divide that by a trillion people. You know what the probability is? Like one times ten to the fiftieth to the sixtieth power. Impossible. Here he selects only eight. That sounds like predestination to me. <laughs> I don't know, but what do you think? Is it predestination? Or is it your choice? That's the debate that's going on among all the churches and the pastors. And they don't agree. They surely don't agree. So God's going to destroy the whole world with the flood. He's going to let it rain for 40 days and 40 nights. And uh, we're reading about that. And it says here uh, about that in, G in Genesis. So you have the Bible up there. God remembered Noah, 8-1. And every living thing and all the cattle that was upon the earth, upon the, in the ark. He put all those animals in the ark. God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters managed. And it took 150 days to get rid of the water. And back in chapter number uh, 7, it says that God was destroying the whole world in 40 days and 40 nights. I'm in chapter 7, Genesis, verse number 4. 7, 4. And yet seven days I will cause it to rain upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Every living substance that I made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. Did he do it? It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Verse number 12 it says. And then it says all flesh died. Verse 21. That moved upon the earth. Everybody died. Then anybody was breathing. He says in 22 you have to be breathing. It's animals that breathe. It didn't kill the fish because they could breathe in the, under the water. And then in chapter 8 God rested. And then he then started the whole thing over again in chapter 9. Now chapter 9 describes that God is going to make a a covenant with the whole earth, and he uses the word perpetual. Perpetual means it's going to start in Genesis 9. It's going to go on throughout eternity. And you know what the covenant is? It's a covenant where I'm going to save you, and I'm going to do it free, free, free by the great work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It's called the per perpetual covenant of God. And it mentions this in verse 11, Genesis 9, 11. I'll establish my covenant with you, all flesh will... Uh, Neither shall all flesh be cut off anymore, and there'll be no more floods, he says, and you're going to have a rainbow, and he says, I'm going to set my rainbow, verse 13, my rainbow, my bow in the cloud, it'll be a token, and he says it three times. Now the word token is where you take just something that's made out of either very light and heavy cardboard and stick it in a machine, and you can get a cup of coffee. Tokens are used for money, and we used to do it back in the war, World War II. And so tokens are mentioned here three times. What, what 
what's three mean? Three is a, the number that God uses about a thousand times in the Bible. Three. It's the number where God is establishing the certainty of something that he has said. The third day, he created life and plants. That was the first time something came alive. They were plants. So three has a number. It has a value. It seems to be that God says it's like empirical evidence. Every time you put two times two, it gets four. Every time you get three times three, it's six. It's like math. It is empirical. It is a fact. We don't doubt about it. Mathematics and chemistry and physics, they are sciences that prove that God keeps his word mathematically. He's doing this with the rainbow. He said the day's coming when this token of the rainbow is going to be changed when I come back. See, the rainbow is going to be changed to a different kind of rainbow. It's going to be what we call the gay flag rainbow. Many believe that the man on the white horse, Revelation 6, the Antichrist is gay. And we have this whole gay movement going on with Obama. And we have a whole gay movement of Freemasonry. They're all connected with the gay movement. 5,000 flags went out uh, July this year. So we have a lot going on. And so in Revelation chapter 8, three asteroids hit the earth. One hits the land, one hits the water, and one hits among the plants. That's what it said. These asteroids devastate the earth. Right in the middle of Revelation, it says that in Revelation chapter 8. And we could read that about the, about the, uh, about the asteroids hitting the earth. And when that happens, they produce a fire bow. Instead of water and rainbow, we have fire where the elements are melting and they are producing strange lights. Many, many, all the colors that you can imagine, but they're coming from fire, the burning up of the elements. And who said this? Well, his name was Peter. Peter said that in 2 Peter. He said, the elements are going to melt with fervent heat, and it's going to form fire above. The whole sky's going to light up. And that is a prophecy of Jesus in, I think it's uh, Matthew 24, 25 and 29. He said, I'm going to give you a sign in the heavens, and then he said, that's going to be that I'm in the sky, I'm coming through the cloud. Now, one of the things that Jesus says is he prophesies about 70 years. And I want you to turn with me, if you could, to look at something. And this is uh, what Jesus says about uh, signs. You're going to have false signs. So if you look at Matthew 24, one of the things that's going to happen is you're going to find in Matthew 24... That Jesus is saying, just before I come back, the 70 to 80 years, just before I come back, I'm going to release Satan to bring nothing but a lot of ministers and pastors, and they're going to be all false teachers. I'm going to read you a list of some of this in a minute. But in Matthew 24, notice what Jesus said about the false signs. And he begins it in Matthew 24, when they ask him, when are you coming back? What's going to happen, Jesus? That's Matthew 24, too. When will you come back? What will be the sign of your coming in the end of the world? And then he begins to tell them in verse 5, 24, 5. Many shall come in my name. They're saying, I am the anointed one. I am the Messiah. I am the Christ. Pastors and ministers. And we've got a lot of them. They're going to deceive many. And then verse 11. Many false prophets shall rise. They'll deceive many. Verse 24. And there will arise more false prophets. More and more and more. False Christ. They're going to be everywhere, thousands of them in every city, all saying that they can heal you and they can make you have the power to, to do all kinds of strange things. And they're all over television right now. They're more than, than they were, you know, 10 years ago. They're really coming out of the closet now. So, but they're signs. And they're going to do wonders, it says in verse 20. Signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. And that's where that word elect comes up again. You see, they can't deceive somebody that really truly has been born again by the Holy Spirit. You will not be deceived. You will not follow someone who's a false teacher and you'll head off to a church or to a religion. You will not do that because the Spirit of God, of Christ, you know what Christ is all about. You're not going to follow somebody that does not teach absolutely that Jesus is God, the Son of God, God the Son. You have to know that about the teachers. So I'm going to list you some of the ones that I've read across these last few years. And uh, so we'll be talking about that in a minute. So here we go. 
I'm reading you quickly that Ron Hubbard started Scientology. Scientology of the Mind by Ron Hubbard. That, that's where you solve your problems by sensitivity training, mentally. And they take you through a whole course of sensitivity. Then you have Shirley McLean. She's been teaching. She's a, a great leader during the last hundred years. And she uh, takes you to have possession by your spirit guide. It's supposed to be a good spirit. And it comes into you, Shirley McLean. Then you have Alice Bailey, who taught that Lucifer was God. And he takes possession of you, Alice Bailey. Then you've got uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses that was started by uh, the Russell. And uh, they don't believe in the Holy Spirit at all. They believe that you get saved without Jesus. And then you've got a guy named Sun Moon. And Sun Moon uh, has a, a big, large following. I think he's got 10 million, 20 million, called the Unification Church. He's joining the whole world together because he's God. Sun Moon is God. And that's called the Unification Church, the World Church. Then Vera Alder, a great leader, she believes in we call the New Age, called the New Age of Aquarius. And every thousand years we go, and that the Earth has to go through a cycle as it goes around uh, the entire Milky Way, and it takes 26,000 years to go around it twice. And so that's in science, too. But she taught the New Age of Aquarius, and this is the one we're at right now, this thousand years, it began in the year 2000 AD. Then you got Christian Science by Mary Baker Eddy. You know, Christian Science, that's you heal all your wounds, your mental and physical wounds by uh, mind control. Henry Fillmore, Unity. He just wants to join everybody behind him, join with him, Henry Fillmore. Joseph Smith started Mormonism. You know, Mormonism is what the people are all running for the presidency. They're Mormons. Joseph Smith started that. He had all kinds of ideas and he wrote his own Bible. Then you got the Seventh day Adventists. They follow the Torah law. So they want you not to do anything on the Sabbath day. So those are your own witnesses. And so you've got to set aside Sunday. And they're under the, top of the Messianic Torah law. Then you've got people that are evolutionists that believe in monkey business. They all came from the monkeys all the way back to the fish and hydrogen gas. Then you've got in, ego, and superego. That's psychology. You know, that's called Freudism. It, Freud taught that. And that's the science of believing that we all came from monkeys once again. And then you've got a guy named Darby, and a guy named Moody, and you 